Intermittent fasting is worse for blood glucose and worse for blood pressure. Compared to what? Like, what are we looking at here? What are we talking about? There's this new paper that came out that is floating around social media and people are twisting this and misconstruing it probably worse than I've ever seen before. I don't usually get riled up about things. I'm usually pretty level, practice a certain level of stoicism, and I try, but this just irritates me because is this where we're going? Are we gonna start taking science and just twisting it however we want to twist it for, it doesn't make any sense. Let's break this sucker down. After today's video, and after I'm done getting very, very angry like I do in this video, I do want you to check out something positive and check out House of Macadamia down below in the description. Okay, that is a 20% off discount code and link down below in the description for anything House of Macadamia related. So that's macadamia nuts, they have crazy onion flavor that's super good. They have amazing different chocolate covered macadamias that are sugar free, white chocolate covered, regular chocolate covered, but then they also have these macadamia nut bars where the literal first ingredient is macadamia nuts because they're legit and they're actually using macadamia nuts and not just playing on the name a little bit. So that link is down below to save 20% off. Stuff is super cool, grown in South Africa, and then they package and do everything associated with the macadamia nuts, a one hour drive from where they are grown. Talk about like, Fresh, fresh, fresh. It is legit, and that link down below and that code will save you 20% off whatever you want from House of Macadamia. So this study comes out, and it's essentially suggesting that this is a revamped, reevaluated meta-analysis of 25 different studies from 2011 to 2021. And they're now suggesting that, well, when we look at this data, we look at all of this data with intermittent fasting compared to caloric restriction, intermittent fasting is actually bad for your glucose and bad for your blood pressure and can lead to cardiovascular risk. That is a bold, bold claim when you can't even fully articulate what intermittent fasting is with the research you're looking at. Now here's the interesting thing. The study itself was okay. The findings were okay. It's how it's being interpreted that's the problem. You wanna know what the main findings of the study was that was comparing caloric restriction to intermittent fasting? The main findings were that there was no change in body weight, no difference in body weight lost, no difference in body fat lost, no difference between waist circumference, but there was a difference in blood glucose. Caloric restriction led to better glucose levels than intermittent fasting. But they don't even mention HbA1c. You know what HbA1c is? That's your 90 day period of glucose. We'll find out why they don't mention that when we investigate some of the studies that were in this meta-analysis. Something's a little bit fishy here. Now, additionally, they said, well, caloric restriction is better for blood pressure. Well, only systolic. Diastolic, there was no significant difference. Now, what the heck is going on here? Well, there were two major, major flaws and these two major flaws were that there were two studies that massively influenced quartz caloric restriction. What do I mean by that? Well, a meta-analysis is looking at multiple papers, and in this particular case, 25 articles, 16 of which were randomized controlled trials. So you would think a meta-analysis is the best of the best of the best. However, if you have a particular study that sways one way way more than the other, it can skew data. And you might be thinking, well, that's just life, Thomas. Sometimes you have those studies. And that's very true, but not when you don't even know what intermittent fasting is in the first place. Like, this blows my mind that we can make a claim against intermittent fasting using studies that don't even use intermittent fasting. Now, before I get into those studies, they also made a mention that they tried to match total energy over the course of the week as much as possible. You tried? You tried to match calories? I'm sorry, but we cannot make a claim as bold as this when the verbiage is already that loose. We tried to match calories. What? <laughs> God. So let's talk about the studies that are in question for a second. Okay, there's two studies that really do influence a lot of this. The first one was a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Actually, nothing wrong with this study in general. In this context, in this verbiage, it's wrong. In fact, I've actually mentioned this study in other videos in a positive way. But this study took women with gestational diabetes. First off, that's not actually my biggest beef with this, but it is an issue. 
why would you take people with gestational diabetes and give advice based upon that to healthy people? Oh, people with gestational diabetes had X results, so that means that you healthy individuals are going to have this result. That's a huge flaw, first off, but that's not even the problem. The design of this study was 1,500 calories caloric restriction, so 1,500 calories per day in a caloric restriction format, compared to 500 calories two times per week, and the rest of the week eating however much you want in your normal habitual patterns. So 1,500 continuous caloric restriction versus five days of eating whatever the heck you flip and want, really, and two days of 500 calories. Not even intermittent fasting. 500 calories for two days. No mention of timing, no mention of anything. I could have had celery for breakfast, celery with mustard and a piece of ham for lunch, and celery with mustard and a piece of ham and a piece of Parmesan cheese for dinner. And it would have been 500 calories, and they would have called that fasting. And again, that study is not my problem. Like, that's actually cool. Like, the, the results with that were actually still interesting. The fact that like, this is put into a meta-analysis, and then people run away on social media because they want to rain on intermittent fasting. Can we stop? Like, what are we learning from this? Nothing. We're learning that people like to fight with each other. Like caloric restriction is great. Intermittent fasting is great. Do what works for you. Stop trying to shoot things down for crying out loud. This is getting old. Now this other study was also published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. This one is even more interesting. And this one really gets me concerned at the overall integrity of things. So with this study, they took a look at caloric restriction versus intermittent fasting, okay? And what they found is that over 12 weeks, caloric restriction led to better glucose levels. In this study, after 24 weeks, there was no difference between the groups. No difference between the groups after 24 weeks, but there was a difference after 12 weeks. You know why someone that's doing intermittent fasting might have higher glucose in the first 12 weeks? Because their body is adjusting to periods of time without eating, and you have what is called peripheral insulin resistance in an effort for your body to preserve glucose for the brain. This stabilizes over time. But why didn't this study, this meta-analysis, this big thing that everyone's talking about, the reason it doesn't mention HbA1c is because probably they will find that intermittent fasting leads to the same, if not marginally better, HbA1c. Long-term, the glucose is just as good, if not better. So it explains why they don't mention HbA1c in this meta-analysis. <laughs> it's just frustrating. Like you're leaving out very important, so you're taking a snapshot in time and saying caloric restriction is better for glucose levels. Why are we still fighting about this? Like no one is, like there's only a small amount of people that are, are not acknowledging that caloric restriction is important. They're acting like people that like fasting completely turn a complete blind eye to thermodynamics. We're not moronic. Like, we're not trying to say that physics and math does not exist. We're looking at evidence and we're looking at timing. So what is the biggest problem? What is the biggest beef that Thomas has with this? And why am I actually irritated, like visibly irritated by this? Because the studies that they're using are not even intermittent fasting in the first place. The two biggest studies that they call intermittent fasting are intermittent caloric restriction. If I tell you to eat 500 calories today, does that mean that you're fasting? No, it means you're eating 500 calories. The idea behind intermittent fasting is the manipulation and the leveraging of time for circadian cues, for stable insulin levels, for a multitude of different things. And here we are skewing what intermittent fasting even is. And poor people that really would benefit from intermittent fasting are afraid to do it now because of this kind of stuff. Why are we standing in the way of people getting healthy? Why are we standing in the way of people doing something that might work for them? This needs to stop. Seriously. Like we cannot just let the manipulation and the complete adulteration of science and how it's interpreted just keep happening. So stand up with this. And if you stand with me on this, comment down below because I'm irritated and you should be irritated too. Regardless of whether you fast or don't fast, why can we call something a spade when it's not a spade? But I will mention something that's pretty cool. That's a relatively new study. I'll end on something positive because I hate being irritated and mad. This study was published in the Journal of Translational Medicine. It's relatively new and it took a look at subjects that did 16-8 intermittent fasting compared to subjects that ate a quote-unquote normal diet. 
both of these diets were consuming 50% or more of their nutritional intake from carbohydrates, including sugar. So it was a flexible fasting plan, if you want to call it that. Flexible. One group was eating as much, basically, carbohydrates and sugar as they want. Another group was eating the same as much carbohydrates and sugar as they want, but they were doing it in a 16-8 time-restricted feeding fashion. No difference in calories, no ultimate difference in macronutrients for the most part. The 16-8 group, after eight weeks, had significantly better weight loss. The 16-8 group still ate three square meals per day. And a lot of their biomarkers looked just as good, if not even better. So the point is, is that you don't need to have something structured and crazy. Even though I don't recommend going out and eating a bunch of Little Debbie's cakes and pies and whatever with your intermittent fasting regime, you're granted a little bit more amnesty by having some timing as long as your calories are still in check because you have time on your side helping you stabilize insulin levels, helping you stabilize and balance the circadian cues. So do what you wanna do. Like fasting, don't like fasting, but don't manipulate science to push a social media post for likes. See you tomorrow.